Good afternoon. It is my pleasure today to speak about one important and even the most important topic that I'd like to speak about, how to retard the progression of chronic kidney disease. And I'm going to concentrate on the most updated messages from recent publications. I always like this topic. This is why we'll find a series of presentations uh, 2017 and the updated June 2018 and today in February uh, 2019 I'm going to highlight some important points I'll start with introduction followed by risk factors because if we know risk factors for progression and we can modify we can change the appearance and the outcome of chronic kidney disease and then I'll end with how to predict and then to conclude this presentation. To start with, what's meant by progression? All of us uh, know well the definitions of chronic kidney disease based on symmetric GFR and the presence or absence of albuminuria. So if we are here, the patients have G symmetric GFR above 60 and the albuminuria was normal, this, is this corner, there is no CKD. It is green corner. But uh, even if we have normal GFR and there is increased albuminuria, either moderate or severe increase in albuminuria, this is CKD, stage 1, stage 2. And if it is uh, cement GFR is, is less than 60, stage 3, uh, from 60, uh, 59 to 45, 3A, from 44 to 33B, and then stage 4, between 29 and 15 and less than 15 it is stage 5. What's meant by progression it is deterioration of the stage from this stage down to this stage. So it is better to know this uh, basic information and to know well the secret of colors in this slide. This is the last report of United States data system numbers here refer to the percentage of patients within each group and if the color changes from green to yellow, orange and red, this means the risk is increased. Red color carries the highest risk. For what? For progression, for occurrence of acute kidney injury, for development of end stage kidney disease and more importantly for the mortality. So progression is bad news. And the progression is uh, uh, change the stage from a stage to the higher stage of CKD. Okay. The first important question, do you expect the declining of the indecision kidney disease? This is the data from the United States as the UC. The, uh, the prevalence uh, of indecision, incidence of indecision from the 1980 up to uh, uh, the current era and then expectation in 2030. By 2030, uh, 30, it's expected and projected to rise the incidence of indecision kidney disease. And the prevalence is also increased, will be increased from uh, the incidence increases by 11 to 18 percent, and the prevalence will uh, rise from 900,000 patients into one. 0.2 million persons over the same period of time. This is because of it changing the demographics of population, obesity, and other risk factors, diabetes, etc. And in the same moment, reduction of the death rate in the population. So death redu is re will be reduced, and the morphology and the demographic criteria will be changed. All these will lead to increased projected rate of incidence and the prevalence of uh, end stage kidney disease. Another important message, this is from BKD trial, study A was preserved estimated GFR or advanced stage. As you see here, the majority of patients, especially in study B, uh, showed the, this linear progression. GFR is reduced uh, linearly through the time of follow-up. So if you are dealing with this patient, we'll expect the occurrence of this stage within a period of time. But not all patients in the study 
followed this pattern of linear progression. Some of them followed this pattern linear and then stabilized in a plateau or non-progressive uh, uh, stage. So always we should put the trajectory and the serial follow-up of the estimated GFR in our mind when we follow up patients with chronic kidney disease. You will be astonished if you will find some patients are following a non-progressive trend in their kidney function. So this is one of important point to be noticed. Yes, chronic kidney disease, by its default, it is progressive disease, but the trajectory for each patient is completely different from the other. What about risk factors? I, I uh, presented in the previous videos on the drone uh, that you'll find on the YouTube, some risk factors including age, but I'm not going to highlight the age, impact of age either, uh, low birth weight in, and the history of uh, childhood uh, coronary kidney, uh, any problems in kidney function and its effect on the future occurrence of uh, the coronary kidney disease or in aged persons how they are affected and the uh, uh, regarding symmetry GFR, kidney reserve, tubular function. Uh, but I'm going to highlight the most recent and the update after the joint presentation. So uh, regarding gender, this is one of these studies. This is correct coronic renal insufficiency cohort study included 3,900 adults. They uh, uh, were uh, women and men, uh, women 1,700 and men 2,100. And uh, in this cohort of patients, the study documented increased uh, rate of progression in men and not only the progression of chronic kidney disease, but also mortality increased in men. So men uh, uh, have increased the rate of progression and mortality. In this very nice review about sexual dimorphism, what is meant by dimorphism is to have the two extremes. Uh, here, if you look, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease before the need of dialysis or transplantation was more common in females. However, progression toward in the stage kidney disease is more common in males. So this is dimorphism. The prevalence of CKD is higher in women, but progression is lower in women. To the contrary, the progression is less in men, but progression is higher, prevalence is uh, less, and the progression is higher in males. Why? The progression is more frequent in men in comparison to women. The exact cause is not well known. However, it may be related to uh, sex hormones. So it seems that testosterone increases RAS system, oxidative stress, inflammation, associated with industrial uh, system abnormality and fibrosis. This is why uh, this changes should be put in mind. And if we go to the last report of United States renal data system, you will find men, male uh, is green color here. The prevalence of indecision kidney disease and dialysis is more common in males. The green color is bad because it reflects the prevalence of indecision kidney disease and this is the progression of chronic kidney disease. So all through countries, all these, can th these countries uh, documented the higher prevalence of in this stage in men in comparison to women, except Taiwan for unknown reason. And if you'd like to read uh, more details about the impact of gender and gender disparities in patients with kidney disease, you can go directly to this uh, nice review. Regarding diabetic kidney disease, the uh, still diabetes is the leading cause of indecision kidney disease and it is bad news and this reflects unmet needs. We should do something to protect the kidneys in diabetic kidney disease and uh, this is why the, uh, I like this uh, issue uh, and for the first time I recorded this video, Prevention and Reversal of Diabetic Kidney Disease for last September. Uh, and today I'm going just to highlight 
some important few messages of diabetic kidney disease. One of them is the effects of different and diabetic drugs on albuminuria. Albuminuria is a representative of uh, the rate of progression. So we'll find the majority of undiabetic drugs by direct or indirect method in, uh, reduce uh, albuminuria. <clears throat> However, the sulfonylurea, the, there is no evidence of a renal protective effect of sulfonylurea. So if you find MCQ question about the uh, nephroprotective effects, except, except sulfonylurea. And the, uh, uh, on January this year, the standards, 2019 standards of diabetic care uh, were uh, published uh, in this uh, supplement of diabetes care. And this is the, for the first time, you will find this statement. So yes, to change and to reduce uh, progression of diabetic kidney disease, we need to optimize glucose control and blood pressure control. And this is two old statements in the different series of the uh, standards of care through the last uh, years, the last decade. But for the first time, the American Diabetes Association added this statement for patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, consider use a sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors or glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists uh, because they uh, are shown to reduce risk of coronic kidney disease progression, cardiovascular events, or both. Yes, the evidence is still is not A, but uh, the uh, literature from uh, different randomized control trial, the effects of these drugs uh, are clear and manifest. Hypertension and the change of albuminuria and the proteinuria. Uh, this is the, one of the important guidelines in the management of hypertension. So if we look at coronary kidney disease, European guidelines recommended targeting uh, blood pressure systolic less than 140, and if the treatment is tolerated, we can reduce to uh, 130 or even less. And the target diastole is in this range from 70 to 79. This is the target for patients aged 18 to 65, and the way this is for other age categories, you can look and compare. So this is a target of treatment according to the European guidelines. American guidelines are recommended from the start to reduce blood pressure to less than 130. Second question, which drug to be used? The drugs according to their uh, order of prescription, if you are here dealing with coronary kidney disease, the first drug is ACE inhibitor or ARB, angiotensin receptor blocker. And the second drug in the prescribing order is a dihydroberidine calcium shampoo blocker or diuretic, followed by either diuretic or dihydroberidine calcium shampoo blocker. And the last one to be added in this prescribing orders is mineral corticoid receptor blockers. What is a beta blocker? Beta blocker. Beta, blocker, beta blockers are reserved for compelling indications for ischemic heart disease, for heart failure, ATC. So, but they are not uh, the drug of choice for, as a, a first prescription. However, in dialysis patients, beta adrenergic receptor blockers are the drug, are drugs of choice. Why? Because in dialysis there is increased sympathetic overactivity. So, in CKD. Uh, ACE inhibitor or ARBs, followed by calcium shunt blocker or diuretics, and lastly, mineral corticoid receptor blockers. In dialysis, beta blocker, followed by dihydroberidine calcium shunt blockers, uh, followed by ACE or ARB, and then lastly, direct vasodilators. And this, the same message from European guidelines for hypertension management, but they preferred from the beginning to start with combination therapy, either ACE or ARB, with either calcium shunt blocker or diuretics. And then to shift to complete the third one, and lastly, add spir spironolactone. And here regarding loop diuretics, if estimated GFR is less than 30, if estimated GFR above 30, cyanides are fine. And the beta blocker to be considered at any treatment step when there is a specific indication for the use 
like heart failure, angina, post MI, atrial fibrillation, or younger women uh, with a planning uh, 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 or, or pregnancy. So this is the the uh, answer of this first two questions, treatment and the drug of choice. Uh, this is a very nice uh, randomized control trial, although it was prematurely terminated because of slow enrollment. And this study compared ACE inhibitors versus ARB and uh, to versus combination therapy in a randomized control trial. And the key message is <coughs> the tolerability for combination is less than uh, S inhibitors and S inhibitor disease than ARB. This means the percentage of the withdrawal was highest for combination, followed by S inhibitors, and lastly ARB. So tolerability for ARB is manifest in this study. Although the study uh, power is affected by the uh, premature termination. Another practical question: If the patient is treated with Ras blockade, and then he develop, develops advanced coronary kidney disease. Uh, do you like to continue ACE inhibitors or ARP or to discontinue? Actually, this was uh, this, uh, the reason of this study of uh, the JAMA 2014, renoprotective effects of renin and jutensine aldosterone system blockade. So the patients with advanced coronary kidney disease are blend either to continue or discontinue is or ARBs. And the key message of this article is to continue, provide that uh, you uh, keep eye on patients and follow them for the occurrence of side effects. Regarding the systolic blood pressure the, and the issue and the fashion of intensive systolic blood pressure control to reduce systolic below 120, here, the data from these uh, two studies, a CORD trial and a SPRINT trial, in each trial, there is an arm for standard treatment and another arm for intensive treatment. And the key message is uh, the survival is preserved and the mortality is less with intensive arm, although you can find some change in the kidney function, so there is some deterioration of kidney function with intensive treatment. However, this uh, analysis, subgroup analysis from SPRINT, documented that yes, symmetric GFR is reduced in the intensive treated uh, arm, intensively treated arm. However, the, when they addressed biomarkers of tubular injury, they found no change or even two of them were reduced in intensive blood pressure control arm. What does it mean? The rise of creatinine or reduction of estimated GFR after intensive blood pressure control is the mere reflection of hemodynamic change and doesn't reflect uh, damage of the renal tubule. Regarding the albuminuria, uh, as uh, albuminuria change, if albuminuria is reduced, this is a surrogate outcome. We can expect renal survival by the change in albuminuria. If albuminuria is reduced, the progression is reduced by this way. So the, this is the meta-analysis for uh, all publications in English from uh, January 1946 uh, up to December 2016, 70 years of follow-up uh, for the studies. Uh, this meta-analysis included 41 randomized control trials and even the authors contacted the, of this meta-analysis, contacted the um, trialists to know the change of albuminuria uh, after six months. And they, uh, the analysis uh, showed that if albuminuria is reduced over six months, as you see here, the clinical endpoints uh, is improved and reduced as well. Especially if we are dealing with albuminuria higher in the beginning, above 30 milligram per gram, and it is reduced to more than 30%, the clinical uh, benefit is uh, very clear and manifest. So this meta-analysis documented that using 
the uh, albuminuria change, especially if it is 30% from, especially for the group of patients with higher albuminuria in the beginning, there is a change in the end points, and as you see here, it is reduced uh, below the significant one. And you can see the different drugs used for the, uh, and the, their effects on the outcome for overall groups and for high albuminuria group. You can fix and uh, note the color of RAS, RAS blockade, low salt, low intake, uh, intake low protein. And uh, the, as you see, the effects of lowering albuminuria is manifest. Even for GN, for IgA nephropathy, reduction of proteinuria is correlated with better uh, outcome. However, we should be cautious again and again whenever we use uh, surrogate outcome because this systematic review showed that the evidence of the use of a change of albuminuria or increased creatinine is not solid evidence. So the uh, change in albuminuria may be uh, of benefit, but the evidence is not uh, strong. Regarding the acute kidney injury, we should know if there, if there was a history of acute kidney injury, because even if acute kidney injury recovers, the risk for development of coronary kidney disease is still high. This may be explained by the effects of epigenetics, because on acute kidney injury there may be epigenetic changes, and this epigenetic changes can increase the susceptibility toward progression and the transition from AKI to chronic kidney disease. And this is one of the most important and the most interesting reviews about the effects of the manipulation of epigenetics and uh, how they uh, work. And I recommend uh, all of you to read the, this article to know the effects of histone acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, all these effects um, and the readers, erasers, and effect on trans transcription, you will uh, understand a lot of information about the epigenetics. Regarding the metabolic acidosis, hyperuricemia, and dyslipidemia, and their correlations with coronary kidney disease. We don't like metabolic acidosis. Even subclinical metabolic acidosis, term known as EU bicarbonatemic. Uh, metabolic acidosis. What is meant by EU bicarbonatemic, serum bicarbonates, is normal in the blood, but the uh, uh, kidney, uh, there is excess hydrogen ion, and the kidney exerts a maximum effect by secreting ammonia. Ammonia binds hydrogen and increases ammonium. Increase the ammonium within renal tissue, uh, increase and promote inflammation a complement activation and eventually chronic kidney disease progression. This is why I encourage uh, the natural sources, fruits and vegetables in early stages of CKD or even to use sodium bicarbonate, uh, trying to reach sodium bic bicarbonate 24 to 26 milli equivalent per liter because it appears to slow the progression of chronic kidney disease without producing serious adverse effects. And this is one of important randomized control trial uh, addressing the effect of correction of metabolic acidosis on muscle mass and renal function. And here, if you look at the lean body mass, this is the control, and this is the intervention arm where sodium bicarbonate was given to patients. So what do you see? Here, lean body mass is reduced, and here, lean body mass is increased. So... Uh, uh, correction of metabolic acidosis is associated with improvement of lean body mass, improvement of the muscle mid-arm circumference, and uh, regarding the kidney here, the serum creatinine in the control is increased and it is reduced in the bicarbonate treated group, so uh, creatinine is reduced and the estimated GFR is increased. This means that the progression of chronic kidney disease is stabilized and even improved uh, with correction of acidosis. Let us to shift to uric acid. Uric acid, this is the cohort of patient. Uh, they proved if we treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia to try 
to reach serum uric acid less than 6 mg per deciliter, here they found improvement of CKD. However, further trial is a randomized control trial in a stage 3 chronic kidney disease uh, with asymptomatic hyperuricemia. They compared the FIBOC state to placebo and they found no significant difference in kidney function after the FIBOC state treatment. And, uh, and so the question is still um, uh, valid. Uh, are we there yet? I think we are not there. And we are waiting the ongoing trials to convince us to are treating a hyper asymptomatic hyperuricemia in coronary kidney disease. We should put in mind the uh, side effects of drugs. As you see from this study, that uh, FIBOC state, in comparison to al aloprenol in this large number of patients, among older patients with gout, with and without cardiovascular comorbidities, the risk of cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality was similar between febuxate and allopurinol. However, there is a suggestion for an increased risk of all-cause mortality associated with long-term use of febuxate versus allopurinol. And the most important is CARES trial, because it is a randomized control trial, published in New England Journal of Medicine to compare the cardiovascular safety of phobic state to allopurinol in patients with gout, including a large number of patients, 3,000 in each arm, and the, as you see here, there was no difference in the primary uh, endpoint composite of cardiovascular death, non-fetal myocardial infarction, uh, or urgent revascularization due to unstable angina. Here in phobic state, 9.8%. 9.4, but uh, the, um, the B value is 0.6. But the difference was in secondary endpoints where cardiovascular disease was significantly higher in FIBOC state treated patients, and the death from any cause uh, was higher in FIBOC state pa uh, treated patients. Uh, in this uh, letter to the editor, the authors tried to uh, challenge the CARES trial, where they found that in the arm of FIBOC state, the, there was disbalance is found in FIBOC state versus allopurinol arm regarding the difference in major and minor differences are there. So here, non steroidal in FIBOC state is higher. Uh, aspirin use uh, was uh, more common in allopurinol treated patients. Uh, however, uh, taking all these together, it is better uh, if we if we like to treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia and chronic kidney disease, it's better to start with allopurinol modified according to kidney function. And if there is intolerability of allopurinol, we may think of FIBOC state. However, I don't recommend at all FIBOC state for advanced coronary kidney disease uh, because of the fear of side effects, and it was not uh, approved in the stage 5 CKD. Regarding this lipidemia, it was shown that higher triglycerides and higher triglycerides to HDL cholesterol ratio, uh, both of them are predictor of chronic kidney disease progression. What about use of statin? Using statin, this is a very interesting uh, network meta-analysis of randomized trials, including 94,000 participants, confirmed that statins are the are very nice drugs for cardiovascular and mortality uh, cardiovascular disease and mortality however uh, regarding the kidney you'll find here a higher percentage of renal dysfunction in comparison to the uh, no statin and with uh, emphasis on the type of uh, statin and the renal dysfunction as you see here uh, atorvastatin is more safe in comparison to the rosuvastatin regarding the kidney outcome. Regarding other drugs, we should think of pharmacology because the kidney is the organ of where the drugs are concentrated and there is increased kidney exposure to drug. Or drug may stimulate immune drug effects like heptin, molecular mimicry, and body formation. Or, the, and this is the example of proton pump inhibitors. Combination with the nephrotoxic drug, if you are treating the patient with non-steroidal ATC and the patient receives methotrexate. 
crystal formation, a cyclovir, drug within the cells, cisplatin, intracellular drug accumulation, the starch, uh, the cast formation, vancomycin, direct drug toxicity like aminoglycosides. So the mechanisms of nephrotoxicity are either drug related, as you see, or patient related. Uh, uh, if the patient uh, uh, has uh, reduced the effective intravascular volume, volume depletion, metabolic abnormalities, acute or chronic kidney disease, altered pharmacogenetics, uh, allergic to drugs, age and gender, race, all these are patient factors. So nephropharmacology uh, depends upon the, and the effects of the drugs depend upon drug-related uh, properties, and patient-related factors. Let us go to one example, the proton pump inhibitor. I'm not, I'm, I am advocative, advocate the, I advocate the discontinuation and this prescription and to discontinue proton pump inhibitors and to stop abusing this class. Yes, it is very important to treat peptic ulcer and severe uh, reflux esophagitis. However, we should limit the time uh, of the treatment, even using them uh, for treat to for preventing stress ulcer in ICU was proven in this study to be of n of no benefit to add bentoprazole to placebo. Uh, so the uh, item of deprescription because proton pump inhibitors cause uh, interstitial nephritis, uh, ag aggravate the coronary kidney disease, associated with electrolyte dysfunction, uh, hypokalemia, hy hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and uh, other side effects. So a lot of side effects should be considered when we think of proton pump inhibitor. This is why I encourage de deprescription. Deprescription includes either to use a smaller dose or alternate day therapy or to be alternating with H2 receptor blockers and all the time it should, the course should be given for a short period of time. In the said, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and chronic kidney disease. This is a very nice, a very recent review about the issue of non-steroidal and how to use them in different estimated GFR and to encourage shared decision making whenever we consider using the short course of non steroidal and this is the guidelines uh, for guiding points uh, for the safe prescribing and i hear i am not i don't agree about safe it is always unsafe to prescribe but we should uh, limit their use for short period of time always mon monitor creatine electrolyte because of the risk of hyperkalemia and hyponatremia Weights and blood pressures uh, uh, before and after any seed initiation uh, consider to protect the kid, uh, stomach, but I don't like proton bomb inhibitor as well. A space in the seed to two hours after aspirin intake because of theoretical risk of antagonizing a uh, uh, salicylic acid action by COX 1 inhibitors. Avoid in the seed if patients are in stress, acute illness hypovolemia, fluctuating kidney function, concomitant introduction or a change in dosage of diuretics and rust blockers, uh, patients with uncontrolled hypertension and volume overload. This is why in CKD, it is, it is better to avoid altogether any seat. Always use the lowest effective dose if it is mandatory and regularly assess the need for ongoing any seat use. Just to simplify it, in the seeds, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can be used cautiously in coronary kidney disease if we agree to use them. I don't, I don't like them. And if, if we should use them, lowest possible dose for shortest period of time and potentially for longer duration after discussing trade-off with the patients. So this is uh, to, uh, to balance between risk and benefits. Antibiotics, the use of antibiotics are famous by uh, raising resistant strains of microorganisms. However, here I am uh, stressing upon another problem is increased risk of kidney stones. Why? Because oral antibiotics disturb gut microbiome and uh, one entity of uh, gut microbiome is to degrade oxalate. So it affects 
antibiotics affect oxalobiome and this is why the use of antibiotics should be judicious for uh, certain indication and to avoid abusing antibiotics. Gut microbiome, there are many studies, although they are a small uh, number, uh, sample size, small, uh, documenting the value of probiotics in diabetic kidney disease and others. Herbal remedies, I don't like herbal remedies because of either herbal related factors or treatment factors or patient factors. Herbal related factors include intrinsic toxicity, incorrect identification, incorrect processing, incorrect storage, adulteration by other drugs like NSA, diuretics, laxative, or using them overdose or the patient situations. Uh, so uh, in, one, in one statement, no for herbal remedies. Regarding lifestyle, it is very important and to know the uh, lifestyles and to change our behavior, so we should combat obesity. Uh, smoking, no smoking, smoking is kidney poison. Avoiding drugs, encouraging exercise. For example, salt restriction. If you look here, this is the study, very nice study, proceed trial. This trial included two phases. It is the, uh, the first phase is the comparison between the low salt and the no low salt. And, then, uh, and uh, regarding the uh, high sodium and the low sodium, you will find here the low sodium is associated with significant reduction of albumin fractional clearance or albuminuria. And albuminuria is to be reduced is a good news. So low salt sodium is uh, efficient in this issue. And after the first phase of comparing low sodium versus high sodium, the patients will uh, were uh, followed crossover study. Uh, in the first part of the crossover, the patients are either treated with high dose of uh, baric acetol to microgram or placebo, and then wash out period, and then to uh, crossover. Uh, those who were treated with placebo uh, received uh, baric acetol and vice versa. And the main result of the proceed trial is uh, baric acetol, two microgram per day, add nothing for those who are compliant with low sodium. But only persons who were non-compliant with low sodium and they consumed uh, high sodium uh, get, uh, got the benefit of uh, baric acetol, but it is high dose and I don't recommend. And it's better to educate patients toward uh, low salt diet. What about vitamin D? Because we discussed now a baric acetol. Up to this moment, we don't know if there is an evidence that the use of vitamin D uh, uh, reduce CKD progression in a stage three and four. However, so we are waiting an evidence for that. If we document a deficiency, we treat deficiency for the sake of deficiency and the side effects of uh, hypovitaminosis D. But regarding CKD progression, uh, there is no strong, strong evidence uh, uh, toward the beneficial effect on CKD progression. Drinking a lot of water. We don't advise at all lack of hydration or dehydration. But what about the coaching to increase water intake? This was the rationale of this study, CKD with trial, where the, we have hydration group and the control group. In hydration group, uh, the patients were advised and coached to drink one to one and a half liter above their standard of drinking. And they were followed up for one year. And the question uh, was, does drinking more water protect against the declining of kidney function in patients with chronic kidney disease? And the answer from the study, coaching to increase water intake didn't significantly slow the decline in kidney function in patients with chronic kidney disease at one year follow-up. We don't know if we follow them for more uh, period, uh, there will be a difference or not. However, we take the positive of this, uh, uh, positive aspects is we don't like dehydration. In the same moment, overdoing by excessive hydration is not needed because of lack of evidence. Obesity, fat, uh, adipocyte hypertrophy, and the obesity is associated with disturbance of leptin, adiponectin, uh, angiotensin 2, TNF, and others, and the mitochondria, and this will lead to oxidative stress, inflammation, and renal fibrosis. 
And you can find here, all through this uh, age uh, spectrum, you'll find increased lifetime prevalence of chronic kidney disease if, if the patient is obese. So obesity is associated with increasing chronic kidney disease either directly by obesity or indirectly through increased diabetes and hypertension. And this is a very nice review about how to treat obesity and how to target the obesity in patients with chronic kidney disease. In this study, metabolic syndrome and its components are associated with increased chronic kidney disease risk in, the, in this uh, in meta-analysis of 11 million participants from 66 studies. This is very nice because if, you, if there is a metabolic syndrome, there is increased risk of odds ratio of uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. The higher the components, the more the components of metabolic syndrome the patient has, the higher, the more the, the risk of chronic kidney disease. What about diets and dietary acid load? What's meant by dietary acid load? Uh, we know the diets, fresh, uh, fr uh, fruits and vegetables are associated with low acid load and even they are natural sources of bicarbonate, of, of base. And the protein is associated with increased acid load and the dietitian can calculate acid load. The higher the acid load, the higher the risk of progression of kidney function, of this kidney, of CKD. Regarding vegetarian diets in chronic kidney disease, encouraging vegetarians and uh, in fruits and vegetables, etc., uh, especially in the early stages of CKD, this will reduce fat, reduce carbohydrate, increase fiber intake, reduce protein, reduce phosphorus, reduce acid load, and reduce salt. All these are beneficial to kidney and the heart and the pancreas. So we encourage the vegetarian diets. Uh, and as you see in this observation, the uh, CKD prevalence is less common in vegans in comparison to other styles of feeding. Uh, low protein, uh, we encourage modest protein intake in chronic kidney disease patients. We don't like very low protein. Uh, because it may lead to protein energy malnutrition, sarcopenia, and frailty. And uh, all these factors can increase mortality. But modest protein restriction from 0.6 to 0.8 gram per kg is, uh, can be uh, a good option for patients with chronic kidney disease. Regarding keto analogs, I am not convinced by their role in uh, retarding the progression of CKD because they are, if they, if, if we will prescribe them, they should be prescribed a high dose, uh, very expensive, and needs the patient to be adherent to special type of food. So uh, practically, they uh, are not of any benefit uh, for my mind. Even there is a randomized control study that showed uh, some benefit. Uh, that was published in JSON. However, the patients were followed up by dietitians and they uh, were adherent to, sp to um, a research environment that it was not, is not, is not available in the daily life. So in one statement, uh, I don't recommend at all the dose that I found in the prescription of many doctors, uh, ketosterior or uh, others, one uh, tablet uh, twice daily. This is not this is not a science. Uh, so regarding low protein diet and the ACE inhibitors or, uh, or uh, androgen receptor uh, blockers to be used together, both of them uh, potentiate each other. So ACE inhibitors have beneficial, uh, beneficial effects. Low protein diet have beneficial effects on phosphate, acid, load, and salt. Both of them uh, interact synergistically to reduce CKD progression. This table summarizes the effects and the benefits uh, and the mechanism of action of combined low protein diet and uh, RAS blockade, as you see here. Uh, vasodilatation, if you use this medication, increase pre and post uh, glomerular resistance by low protein diet, De decrease activation of uh, emitor, reduce RAS activation. And you can find here uh, a reduction of hyperfiltration, a reduction of hyperfiltration, uh, a reduction of proteinuria, a reduction of proteinuria. So there is, there are many beneficial effects, and this table summarizes 
the uh, mechanism of beneficial effect on renal vessels, glomeruli, tubular interstitial compartment, and on the systemic effects of both ACE inhibitors or ROB uh, and transistor blocker use uh, and the low protein diet. What about diet soda? This is a bad habit because diet soda is associated with increased uh, risk of end stage and CKD progression. Why? Maybe due to in increased phosphorus content, acid load, or disturbance of gut microbiome. Red meat, they contain, red meat uh, contains essential amino acid, and this is a uh, uh, finding, but on, to the, on the other hand, the red meat includes uh, heavy so sodium, phosphate, uh, associated with proteinuria, and oxidative stress, so we don't recommend the red meat. It seems that Mediterranean diet is the best diet to be followed for patients with chronic kidney disease. And I'm happy and proud uh, to uh, establish Renal Nutrition Fellowship at Mansoura University. And I hope the success in this trend. Regarding sleep, sleep quality and the quantity, uh, both of them are important because sleep quantity, either low sleep, lack of sleep, less than five hours, or excessive sleep above eight hours, were associated with increased CKD progression, so the uh, relationship is U-shaped, and uh, as well as the um, quality, uh, fragmentary sleep is also bad and associated with progression of chronic kidney disease. Environment. Environmental pollution is associated with many problems in different systems, including kidney disease, and if you go and read this um, uh, article that reviewed epidemiological studies, pharmacokinetic studies, and toxicological studies regarding perfluorinated chemicals as emerging environmental threats to kidney health, is very nice uh, review. And this is included in the um, food processing, and uh, and so I recommend you to read these two articles: environmental pollution, and kidney disease, and this uh, article. Uh, we need to reach the GP and to train nephrologists because referral to well-trained nephrologists may make a, big, a great difference. We can predict uh, a progression of chronic kidney disease and the kidney function by uh, studying MRI. Uh, here, for example, arterial spin labeling. Here, this is a normal perfusion. Here, they reduce the perfusion. And in arterial spin labeling, there is no need for gadolinium. And this perfusion study depends upon the inherent characters of the blood. However, I don't recommend MRI to predict chronic kidney disease progression because it is sophisticated uh, techniques. Uh, however, uh, I, I uh, suggest and recommend to follow the practical ones as shown from this study, uh, following practical parameters and clinical demographic characters of the patients in this large cohort of patients, you can know the transition from a stage to stage or to dialysis or mortality after two years, after four years. In a very simple manner, if you write on Google kidney failure risk equation or kidney failure risk one word dot com, you'll find this uh, site, just click on the calculator, you'll find this very simple data, the age of the patient, gender, region, GFR, milli per minute uh, as calculated, and urine album and creatine ratio, and then calculate. Uh, here I selected the album creatine 38 in a male sex, aged 51 year, and it's image GFR 55 milli per minute. If, if and then apply it, calculate, and this is the risk of end stage after two years, 0.17 percent, and after five years, 0.69 percent. And in this study, they uh, found that kidney failure risk uh, uh, if, uh, calculation by this equation uh, was uh, uh, correlated with the occurrence of end stage kidney disease. Uh, very. Uh, confident. And the, I would like to end with this study and with this data. We should educate ourselves, educate doctors, educate patients because low education is synergistic, has synergistic effect with other risk factors to increase coronary kidney disease. So we need uh, more and more education. And uh, you can find a lot of data on this site. 
and the uh, uh, we need, we um, learned a lot of the wisdom with dealing with seniors and with uh, uh, meeting together share the decision making and discussion the patient in with experts make a great difference in their management and the last statement that i'd like to end this presentation please uh, i advise you and me myself always to be a student because once uh, we decided that we are not students and we are experts and the, this means that the doctor inside uh, ourselves dies so a doctor is a student till his death when he fails to be a student he dies up to this uh, this moment and so i would like to thank you very much for good listening and i'd like uh, to receive uh, your questions from my email goodbye and good luck